Good day, everyone, and welcome back to TVUP Health Issues. This is your host, Dr. Teddy Herbosa, uh, with our guest. This is part two of the UP COVID-19 Pandemic Response Team. And on this episode, we will be discussing about data, data management, data analytics, and information. With us today is Professor Mahar Lagmay, uh, Dean Jomar Rabahante, and Professor Peter Kaiton. Uh, maybe we'll start with asking uh, Mahar, Professor Mahar, uh, can you tell us about the product of the UP COVID-19 uh, pandemic response team's dashboard that it created on the web portal? That's right. Uh, we showcase all of the outputs of the efforts of the UP pandemic response team, no? of the entire UP system, no? those who wanted to help wanted to help in the COVID-19 efforts in a website called ncov.ph. Uh, that's the people spelled, are seeing uh, it now on the screen. Yeah, yes. that's spelled E-N-D-C-O-V.ph. And it's, uh, it contains a lot of information. Uh, it started off as a website that was supposed to cater to uh, UP employees, no? UP faculty, employees, alumni, students, because uh, we're a big population as well. But eventually, when we put it out, uh, a lot of uh, non-UP people also were interested because uh, it contained information that were, I believe, were helpful, helpful to them. At least that is uh, the feedback that I'm getting. Uh, at, I, at one point in time, I think it was it had uh, uh, several thousand users per per minute. No, um, depends on the season. It <laughs> depends on the time. Uh, if the COVID uh, uh, numbers uh, or active cases are low in a the day, then yung yung visit visitors also go go down. But uh, quite recently, when there was a search, uh, we had a lot of uh, downtime of the, of the end of that PH because there were a lot of uh, visitors using the, the website endcov.ph. Now, the endcov PH, again, uh, is the output, is the sh this showcase for the outputs of all of the research that uh, the UP faculty and uh, uh, volunteers of the UP pandemic response team are doing. Uh, in short, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, state that uh, this kind of uh, output uh, showcases not only the current data, it showcases yung mga nowcasts, so good for probably one day or two days, and then also the forecasts, uh, risk assessments, as well as scenarios of the COVID-19 problem that we have. Um, there are inputs coming from mathematicians, statisticians, geographers. We always talk through Facebook, the Facebook group and generate the uh, output that uh, you would see here. It even includes uh, a part there, which is well, not really artificial intelligence. Some might call it as AI already. But in the true sense, is, I believe that it's not really AI. But some may consider it as AI already. And it's called YANI. Mm -hmm. um, there are also uh, non-mathematical non <laughs> non uh, uh, aspects here in this uh, website. Like, like the work of uh, the group from NCPAG, Chris Berse, no? Uh, wherein he compiled all of the policies, uh, policy statements, advisories, policies of the different LGUs, etc. So basically what I'm saying is that uh, it contains a lot of information, a lot of infographics, policies, information that people would need, uh, including the nowcasts, the forecasts, so that we can anticipate and scenarios so that we can uh, plan in advance our fight against COVID. So to show you the details of uh, what is inside the ncov.ph, I would transfer the microphone or the floor to 
either Peter or or um Jomar. Go ahead, so guys. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I'll just butt in when uh, when necessary, no. But uh, I leave it to you, Peter and Jomar. So for me, for the non-mathematician in this uh, particular panel, these were data visualizations. To me, I got to see how the numbers look like because if you just showed me numbers, it doesn't excite me as much as it excites Peter. <laughs> but because they are presented in visual format, I'm a surgeon. I'm trained to look at stuff and visualize stuff. So if I see a lump, it's there. It's a lump. So this is this is what it has done for me as an individual that's a non-scientist looking at uh, this table. So maybe who will describe it? Peter or Jomar? Peter. Okay. Uh, yeah, let ahead, me Peter. describe first the features of the dashboard and the maps and also the statistics. And I'll give it to Jomar to talk about the projections and the city versus COVID. So first of all, this is the case overview and the first thing that you'll see when you access the ncov.ph dashboard. And well, here we have details for NCR, the total cases graph in terms of cumulative counts, the current. Uh, existing counts, though these will be updated later on. These are still reflecting yesterday's counts, but they will be updated later on today. And also some breakdowns of the cases. Now, there is a second tab here, which is PHP, uh, PSPHP graphs. And this is uh, work that uh, Jomar, Darwin, and I do with the Leads for Health Security and Resilience Consortium, which is uh, formed by the PSPHP and its members. And here we are showcasing a lot of the uh, products that we've done, like, for example, the national epidemic indicators for time varying are case fatality, recovery rate. And you can also, in fact, interact with this to look at like the daily cases and active cases and the growth of cases through time. And you can also change how long you want to look at the data. And as we've talked about in the previous episode, the uh, look on the RT. Uh, I believe there are still some, there are still updates happening because there was data released earlier at 4 p.m. Uh, so these will start to uh, update. And this is now, okay, so we have the current trend of the RT that we're seeing here. Going down. It's slightly going down, po, and I anticipate that as the new data comes in for April 7, it will again go down because of the current reported uh, cases by the DOH. Now, let's go with the map view. And this has uh, gained a lot of exposure recently, our map statistics. At the default, you'll see the uh, municipal counts of COVID-19 color-coded so that you can see uh, in terms of the different counts per municipality in the Philippines. You can adjust the data that's presented on the map by looking at the data layers available. And we do have, for example, public schools in DepEd because it has been the recent talks about, uh, there have been talks about opening schools uh, uh, on a limited fashion, however, because of the growing uh, the growing number of cases, we there have been a pause in terms of that policy. There's also uh, recently a more helpful uh, tool in terms of showing the hospital capacity uh, hospitals in NCR and most regions in terms of the capacity that's still available. And if we, for example, zoom in further, we could access the uh, existing uh, COVID-19 dedicated uh, capacity rate, 100% in Manila cent uh, in medical, medical Manila Center. Medical Center as of April 4. So here, at least with the available data that uh, is uh, given by uh, the DOH, we are able to at least look into what could be the available spaces for the different hospitals uh, in NCR and also outside NCR as well. Uh, right now, there's also a data on COVID-19 testing centers, though uh, this still is for updating, especially that uh, based on the most recent count that's available in this map, 
there is about 100 to 150 laboratories uh, already registered in address here. Uh, later on, uh, the additional uh, laboratories that have been reporting recently, like around at least 200, would be now uh, integrated in this map as well. Now, there's also the quarantine facilities map. The COVID hospitals, they're already redundant with regards to the details with the occupancy rate. So those are already okay. Now, let's look at the active cases in terms of uh, we're monitoring active cases here. There is the provincial level active cases. So as you can see, with much of the nationwide, we can see that there is the uh, greater Manila area having a lot of cases. But as you can see, it also kind of uh, bleeds over to Pampanga, Batangas, and there have been certain noted uh, high cases, high number of active cases in Isabela, still in Cebu. Uh, that could be helpful in terms of uh, showing those uh, provincial active cases that are existing. Uh, this one, we are due to update the active cases per 100,000 population in the municipal level. And in the future, we are planning to do this at the barangay level as well, in terms of giving that information on the concentration of active cases per 100,000. More recently, we're able to update it for Metro Manila because this is the kind of data set that's available right now by the researchers of the UP COVID-19 pandemic response team. Blue is not a good color because it means that all, uh, almost all of the barangays have at least 100 or more active cases per 100,000 population. Uh, you might see some uh, areas of which that would not be the case, like, for example, much of the gig. Uh, a lot of northern uh, Kaloocan, some areas in southern Kaloocan, and uh, the southeast portion of Makati. But as you can see, it is a large distribution of a uh, large density of cases in much of the barangays in Metro Manila. More recently, we've gained some uh, popularity with the public in terms of showing the dot maps. This has been a very... Uh, a very visceral uh, very dramatic. data display, a very yeah. dramatic data dramatic. display in terms of really showing the, uh, the, the distribution and the scale of the epidemic. And more recently, we've been releasing maps, uh, not in NCOV, but in the future, it will be available in NCOV. We've been releasing uh, maps of different areas outside NCR, like, for example, Region 3 and 4A. And uh, we've also shown a, an initial map for the whole country. But I am part, and we are looking at the mapping activities of the UP COVID-19 response team. And we are going to be developing more interesting and interactive maps for the public to interact with regards to the uh, uh, active case spread of COVID-19. Uh, in one of our uh, in one of the policy papers that the UP COVID nineteen has written, uh, we were also showing about the risk assessment per province based on the existing number of active cases, and this is where what we call the uh, probability of outbreak, and this is based on research looking at how uh, the concentration or density of uh, people in a province and later on in a municipality, as I will show later, and the existing number of active cases can relate to what is the outbreak risk of a province in terms of spreading COVID-19 to the point that uh, there is a risk that it might not be easily controllable now. So here we can see that the 99% and above, that means that there's a probability of outbreak uh, that is at least 99% means that there is a very high risk that COVID-19 will spread. And in some regions, it has already uh, been an outbreak of COVID-19. Uh, there are some exemptions that we will see here, like, for example, uh, Sulu. Uh, we also have here uh, Davao Occidental. And there are, uh, if we look at, Another level of the probability of outbreak, which is the risk assessment of uh, outbreak. And this is for the municipal assessment. And 
the with the municipal assessment, a lot of these are mostly like very sensitive because if we see that there's at least one case in a municipality, especially with the kind of features COVID-19 has right now, uh, it could be a risk for that municipality in terms of an outbreak of COVID-19. So this is the kind of uh, data that we see in terms of the municipal level. And in fact, with the kind of data that we have here, you could see more than one data layer, but that is for the interactivity that we have here of the map with the UP COVID-19. Um, Before you proceed, Peter, let's just yes. be clear. This format, this dashboard is free to the public. Yes, this it is, is free available to, the public. to anyone who can type, who has internet access, yes. has a web browser, yes. and can type in ncov.ph and they will be... Uh, uh, viewing all of this information that you were just showing. Yes, correct. correct. Yes, Paul. They don't uh, have to pay. They don't have to log in. They don't have to have a subscription, etc. The it is freely available. Uh, you just need to have access to the internet, and you will be able to see these information available to the public as a service of the university to the people. And what Mahar promotes as open data. So, so can you show some more of the other features of this, uh, Jomar? You also have some of your model uh, projections and models in uh, graphs and uh, charts that have been very useful to the policymakers, government officials, and ordinary people. Can you show what those features are? Yeah, in the projections tab. Okay, in this uh, projections tab, we have actually uh, three types of projections. The first one is the in terms of cumulative number of cases. And then the second one is the deaths, spared cases. And then the last one is uh, on the um, epidemic curve, okay, the new cases per day. So I think we can start first with the new cases per day. Um, this one, as you can see, we have a range here of uh, possible uh, levels of, of uh, cases in a day because we, we run uh, 1,000 simulation scenarios. Um, the green one is the optimistic side where all of our interventions will be okay, will be effective. And then the, the red one is the pessimistic uh, scenario where most of our interventions are not working. And currently, um, we are at the, at the middle of the red and the orange. The orange mm. is the mean. Um, however, sometimes there will be some peaks. Like remember, we had 15,000 cases in a day. Um, yeah. but, here, but here, of course, it will go up to 15, but there's no 15K here yet. Um, I need to update the actual numbers there. But it's very hard to, to really plot there the actual, yung actual, because we know the actuals are dependent on the validation delays of the OH. Uh, Validation but, and reporting delays of the reporting laboratories delays. and all the yes. technicians and people getting sick and not reporting for one week. You know. Yes, yes. So, but uh, in essence, I I I believe uh, if we're going to delete those uh, delays, it's really somewhere uh, in, at the middle of the red and the orange. So it means that we still need to do more to make the number of cases lower and lower or. In the language of Peter, it should be way, way lower than RT equal to one. It should be less than one. Okay. Then, um, in terms of our projections about the deaths, uh, yeah, death here, it is somehow uh, along that side, the, the blue one, uh, nandyan yung, ano, yung, yung trend. However, I, I, I need to point this out. If you go at the 2020 side, 2020 period, you can see. Um, we, we did the projections of this debt uh, around December 25 last year. And we used the, the data for fitting the blue one. It's the actual, actual reported uh, debts uh, during that time, December 25. But as you can see, every day there will be additional debts uh, to be reported, you know. So the actual debt now is the black one. So it means that we really delays in the reporting of deaths. But uh, still with projection, it's along the, the projected range. 
And then for the cumulative, yeah, for the cumulative here, we actually revised our simulations here because previously our cumulative is along that band. Uh, yung, uh, ano ba yan? It's, it's like a greenish brown and up to the uh, red. But we, we revise it because we now have, we experience now a surge in cases. So it is something like that, not so good <laughs> increasing. Uh, it's, it it's actually looks like a line, but actually it's exp ex uh, exponential. So I hope that after our interventions, we're not really going to that level. Yeah, so this is in terms of projection that might help our decision makers in their response. And then the second, uh, the, the other tab is the city versus COVID. This is created by the group of, of course, the UP COVID-19 pandemic response team headed by uh, Sir Chris Berset. It is uh, uh, led by Sir Chris. Yeah, and so he, here is, actually, I, I really like this tab because we know most of the cases are in cities and we really need to, to monitor the cities. So dito, what we can see are the active cases, recovered and expired cases in cities. And of course, compared to the whole country. And from here, we see it's 71% coming from the cities. For the another favorite is the road to recovery. So this is also uh, one of my favorites. Okay, so uh, here we, we can see the the different cities. You can look at the the data. Okay, yeah. It just so, takes a while. A while because we have eight hundred. have a lot of data. <laughs> yeah, interesting to me cases. with your data is that uh, you guys have analyzed the data and it comes out as processed information. Uh, unlike our Department of Health that keeps reporting every day, is static numbers. You know. So what I love with you, scientists and mathematicians, is you you visualize it. You've gotten that data. Our data sources is still the Department of Health, right? We get the raw data, but you you put it and you crunch it and you analyze it into maps, into uh, you know figures and graphs that become useful. And uh, so that's the part that's not happening on the Department of Health side. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, can I answer that, Hello? Uh, can I answer that? Go ahead, Mar. Go ahead, Mar. Yeah. Uh, well, Come the in. model for of, of uh, the pandemic response team is to get the information out, no? Um, because the people need it. They need to visualize what is happening, and it needs to be on a nationwide scale. And the the uh, motivation really is that. Uh, we need to deliver through digital technologies. We have to maximize digital technology to our advantage. Uh, if we don't do that, uh, we are not maximizing and we're at the losing end. The, the, the information that is provided here is not only static or current data. It's got a lot of analysis already crunched numbers, uh, the, the, the numbers have been crunched by the mathematicians, and uh, they're all out there, uh, seen in ncov.ph nationwide, so that the LGUs can take a look at them and be able to use them as uh, their basis for decision making. No? Uh, right. I think that kind of model needs to be adopted. Because the model now for a lot of information like this, there's a big discussion about it. Some say that it will generate panic. It will create a lot of trouble. Some people may use those data. The, no. The, what is important is that people know the real score. People right. need to know the truth, what is happening. And people need to know the analysis. Because... Uh, they need that. They need it because, after all, everybody is affected. Our and, loved ones and, are affected. And Prof. Right? Mahar, you always uh, right. espouse when you talk. You always espouse with probabilistic approach to DRR. 
to risk management. So you always talked about scenarios, not the static number, yes. but yes. the probabilities that happen out of the risk that is uh, occurring or the hazard yeah. that is occurring. They should so know that. the risk. Can you explain probabilistic versus uh, uh, what that the static type of uh, anal analytics? Well, I can explain that in, in simple terms, no? uh, but I, we have a statistician here who can explain it much better. <laughs> uh, uh, I defer to, to Peter to explain Peter, the ahead. difference explain between deterministic and probabilistic. Probabilistic, yeah. So let's educate yeah. the people. Well, for one, with regards to disaster risk, in, in, in statistics, when we think about risk, built into it is the uncertainty. And it is by planning with regards to uncertainty that is important with disaster risk reduction and management. Um, I personally, in terms of my research in economics and finance, I've always been pondering what is the worst thing that could happen to our economy? What's the worst thing that could happen with financial markets? That's why much of my personal research before with the pandemic response team is about talking about risk management in terms of finances and always planning at what could be at the worst possible scenarios so that even when these occurrences happen, we are at least padded in terms mm -hmm. of the impact of these uncertain, uh, low probability but high impact scenarios. Wonderful. So you guys are not only disaster scientists, you're also w w what I call data scientists. Because you're crunching the data, analyzing the data, and making it useful information for policymakers. That's correct, right? So, so tell me the story, and any of the three can actually jump in. Uh, we had a lot of struggles with how we manage our sources of data, uh, how we were, you know, validity of the data, the quality of the data. We even put out one policy paper on quality of data, I remember. So let's talk about that. Uh, what do you think, with these things, improving these things about data management would actually improve our response to the next pandemic? Any, anybody wants to share experiences? Siguro simulan ko na po muna about okay. this. Go ahead, Peter. Especially with regards to the context of our policy paper number six, yung, <laughs> which is about with the data management, the issues. Uh, for me, that really started off as a rant to how I was looking at the DOH data in terms of them changing the, the, the format of the data. I had to tone you guys, remember? <laughs> I had to tone down <laughs> that policy paper. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. Tell the story. And um, it's the ideas like, why is there these discrepancies between different sources? There have been like sudden changes in terms of uh, the missing of the missing data, and missing then suddenly data. it changes the status. Um, and there was a change in the nomenclature as well. They changed yes. nomenclature somewhere in the middle, right? <laughs> yes, they did. Um, they were inconsistent with like date formats and everything. Like it almost changed every one or two weeks. So, Correct. which really is difficult if you're already established into analyzing the data, so that when it comes in again, uh, you could process it kind quite quickly. So every time we've always been like, uh, so you guys always told me the it. data was dirty. Yes, very dirty. You said the data was very dirty, and it, you had difficulty analyzing and crunching the numbers because the data you got, the data drop every day was dirty data. That's right? Yes, it is. Um, like, you would you would think that uh, Manila is a city in NCR, but then suddenly there would be another data of Manila somewhere else. Correct, correct. And suddenly we would be finding like barangays of Manila being declared as cities or provinces <laughs> Like, for example, Even you your find place Dilon. wasn't found. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, which, uh, which I slightly felt, um, why is my town missing? Because I always yes. um, uh, religious in terms of looking at the situation of my hometown. And yeah. I've been uh, pretty much sharing that and blurting that out to yeah. really point out that there's a problem on the data. There was another problem we had actually at the beginning when we established ngov.ph as a website. There was another group that actually created a Facebook site named ngov also. 
and actually opposed our uh, being published as an ENCO. Uh, anyone can tell me about that? Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, I know, I know about that because later on, uh, after opposing, later on they approached us and asked us to include their products into the ENCOV site on website, the basis yeah. that uh, the ENCOV.ph was, uh, I think, uh, they thought was more popular than the site. Uh, so we had more visitors than the site that they have. So we welcome them. I mean, all efforts mm -hmm. are welcome. Inclusive. So we have open yes, data. Inclusive. We have inclusive approach to uh, to this uh, pandemic. And we anyone who wants to volunteer was accepted, right? That's correct. That's correct. Ah, uh, pero ano EVP? Sagutin ko nito naman yung ano yung uh, probabilistic, no? No, it's really about making scenarios, no? And I would like to put an international flavor to this one. In fact, uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, no? When we talk about scenarios, no? We tama yung sinabi ni ano? We're trying to deal with uncertainties, and they would say sa IPCC. Uh, that the goal of working with scenarios is not to predict the future, but to better understand uncertainties and alternative futures in order to consider how robust different decisions or options may be under a wide range of possible scenarios. So that is what uh, we are dealing with. No? Because we have found out that uh, in, disaster, in, the, in disasters that have been happening here in the Philippines, we always hear the people saying, "Ay, first time nangyari ito. This is uh, never happened. This has never happened before. We've never seen seen a flood." Until we solve that problem, we will always be hearing it. No, we have to prepare for scenarios that are bigger than the historical record or bigger than what we have experienced. No, so by doing that, we are doing anticipation. We are uh, planning in an anticipa uh, anticipatory manner. And uh, by doing that, we are preparing better for future events. Diba? And that's the, the kind of risk that uh, we have to prepare for, no? depending on our resources. Now, uh, yun nga, ang importante, probabilistic, no? uh, marami po tayong nilalagay dyan so that uh, the LGUs can, 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 use that, can, can, can use it for their city or municipality. But still talking about uh, the international thing, no? yung uh, total nandiyan na rin naman tayo. That is for disaster risk reduction, yung concept ng open data yes. uh, is a trend already in disaster risk reduction. Europe, the America, have been, they have been sharing all of their data sets because they know that by sharing, more people can work on the problem. More, more scientists can generate knowledge no? uh, that we can use. Now, uh, there's a lot of data that is uh, just... Uh, uh, well, before you go ahead, let yeah. me just explain yeah. what really happened because uh, mm -hmm. I remember we asked for a data sharing agreement with the Department of Health. Remember that? We had Correct. a data sharing agreement and it took like three months or four months and there was, it wasn't moving. Yeah, the data sharing now. agreement. <laughs> so, so, that's another problem we encountered yeah. because they were claiming Data Privacy Act and they didn't want to share because we wanted to go all the way to the barangay and the individual. And they were claiming, their data privacy officer was claiming, no, you have, we, we cannot just freely share this. But we were on the other end saying, this is open data and we can crunch it and you can anonymize the data and share it to us. But I think nothing ever happened to that data sharing agreement. Uh, well, at least we tried. <laughs> we tried our best. But there are stumbling blocks. No? Correct. Uh, what we really need to do is to push this no, open data because it is the trend for addressing our disaster problems correctly. No? We need more scientists. Science needs to be trusted. No? Uh, Peter was talking about uh, yung uh, data na hindi maganda, no? that can be improved. He, he was also talking about uh, people, other than people in government, who work on the data. No? So kapag ka naglalabas, uh, sa science kasi, uh, they, they, yung, yung nilalabas needs to be replicable. No? Mm -hmm. That is a foundation of science, no? 
uh, your methods, whatever you say needs to be replicated. It is can the be truth. replicated. It is the truth. How can you replicate it if there's no data that is available for you to 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 review and check the methods, no? right. the outputs. No? So, importante, if we are to trust in our decisions and if uh, people are saying that it is science-based, the science must be amenable for review. And to right. review it, you need data. So, data must be open. And on another aspect, no? another aspect, can you, can you hear me, ano, uh, EBP? Yes. No? Yes. Uh, on another aspect, when you communicate, when you communicate, like now I'm talking to you, and uh, we want to, 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 when we communicate, somehow, diba, our intent is to be able to convince. Diba? But how can you convince if there is no trust? It is yeah. very difficult to communicate without trust. And if you are to walk, also to work as, as a whole of society, uh, we need to get uh, uh, all of these data sets in silos so that we can uh, do a better analysis. Because right. when we plan against disasters, we plan it not just for the health sector. We plan it for agriculture. We plan it for education, tourism, energy, infrastructure, and all sorts of uh, all right. other sectors of society. For the whole of society. For the Correct. Whole of society. So the more data that we have, the more data that we can integrate uh, through open data, no, not residing in silos, the better our country will perform against disasters. If we are able to perform better against disasters, progress can take place. Development can take place unhampered by all of these problems about natural hazards. Wonderful. Wonderful data. We actually started talking about a dashboard, just a plain and simple dashboard with lots and lots of data and lots and lots of analysis and graphs and visualization. And from there, we've learned so much about this pandemic, which was new, the way it behaved, the way it spread, uh, even how our data was managed, even how data was collected by our own government colleagues in government agencies. And uh, I, I, I think you guys have been able to show the value of what the academician can bring to the table in the time of a pandemic. And I, I'm sorry, guys, this has been a very interesting discussion, but I guess we're also uh, short of time. But I'll ask for your final words, and I'll start with uh, Peter, uh, Jomar, and then Mahar. For your lessons learned here in this experience on uh, data management in the time of an epidemic or in the time of pandemic. Peter? So with regards to all of the data that we've contained in NCOV and also with our maps, there's one thing for me that's always crucial to reflect upon. The numbers, the statistics, the dots, they're not just these esoteric items. These are people. And it is by having the data being made available to all that we can start giving more context to the situation by looking that these numbers, these dots, these figures, these are all people. And we want to tell the story of people for the improvement of people's lives. Wonderful. The power of data to tell stories. Uh, I know of an epidemiologist who does that very well. He tells stories through these graphs and his... Uh, pictures. And I think that's what you guys are doing. You are storytellers telling that data. Jomar? Yep. Um, I think uh, there, in general, there's no perfect data set. Many data sets, especially big ones, huge data sets are not really that clean. But I hope it will be our target to make it near perfect. Okay, And I hope uh, the OHB4, uh, uh, I hope they appreciated what we did last year in pointing out their errors because we want our data sets to be, as what Peter is saying, to be as clean as possible, to be somehow near perfect because we're talking about lives of people. Lives. And uh, I think the other take-home message here is we also need to look at different perspectives about uh, data sets. If we think uh, there are some issues with the national data, we can also uh, work with LGUs because... Uh, we know LGUs, they have their own data set and 
we might look at their own data set so we can have different perspectives, different um, uh, like phases of the story. So yun po. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jomar. And finally, Mahar. Yeah, we're talking about the power of data. No? Uh, especially during times of uh, emergencies or times of disaster. Uh, you don't really know what kind of information or data sets that uh, you may need. We don't, we don't know uh, what we need. No? For example, during a landslide, uh, everything was covered. The size of the landslide was three-fourths of UP. And they were buried under 30 meters of rubble. And there was a text message that's the, of, of a teacher said that there are 200 children here. There were 2,000 people, search, uh, search and rescue people, trying to unearth them. But they did not know the location. Mm -hmm. At that time, they needed a GPS point. Everybody knows what a GPS point is. But that data set, that, that GPS point, was not available as open data. It took seven days before that data set, which was held in, 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 a, in an institution, uh, to be given to the search and rescue people. By that time, the water has already rose, and, and uh, there was no chance for the survival of people. So during disasters, open data is really critical. It's very important. But it's not only during disasters that we need them. We need them to plan our local government units well, not just in one sector, but across all sectors. So all data sets must not be in silos. They must be integrated so that we can have good plans for all 1,700 plus cities and municipalities of the country. It uh, encourages or fosters uh, uh, trust. It, it fosters transparency that is required by science and that is required in communicating disaster information. So open data, I believe, and the rest of the, of the scientists in the world believe is the, the way is, is the way to go in effective disaster risk reduction uh, and resilience. We need that. Uh, I, I urge all our congressmen and uh, our legislators to pass that bill. It's, it's already a bill. Uh, on open, there's a bill on open data. We need it for the pandemic. We need it for all hazards in the country to address or and mitigate the harsh impacts of all hazards that uh, are going to affect our country. Well, on behalf of the Filipino people, I'd like to thank you guys, academicians, mathematicians, scientists, data scientists, disaster scientists, for your contribution in this fight against pandemic. I didn't realize it was so exciting to talk to a statistician, uh, bio, biologic mathematician, and a disaster scientist, geologist. But uh, I will just end this session by describing a quote from one of my professors in disaster medicine. And he said, Today is the information age, and we are swimming in oceans of data. But the oceans of data need to flow to be organized and become rivers of information. Because if you organize data, it becomes information. And from the rivers, you go to lakes of knowledge. As you, as you analyze the information, you end up with knowledge. But what is most important, he said, are the droplets of wisdom that you get from the lakes of knowledge. With that, thank you very much for guesting my uh, episode this evening. And uh, thank you, everybody. We do hope everyone has learned with our discussions on ncov.ph, data management, and science. Thank you very much, and good evening to all.